talking on the top in topics related to social and demographic research. They are Alan Dafo and Beth Novak. Um, our first speaker will be Alan Dafo, um, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Yale University and faculty fellow at both the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Professor Dafo's research examines the causes of war and statistical methods for credible causal inference. He won the Lemur Rosenthal Prize for Open Social Science on emerging, and as an emerging researcher for his work improving transparency practices. His PhD in political science is from the University of California, Berkeley, and he has an MA from, uh, in economics from Berkeley and an undergraduate degree from McMaster University. So welcome, Professor Dafo. Thanks so much. Uh, so it was a real pleasure to have uh, Brian just share with us all the uh, fantastic tools that they're building. Um, and in many ways, much of what I normally would say to a typical audience, I am going to skip through uh, because I think both this audience is more uh, expert and, uh, in these topics, and also Brian covered a sort of a lot of the motivation and um, uh, sort of overall philosophy about uh, transparency that I would otherwise say. So. Uh, Transparency is crucial to science. Uh, science is a public enterprise, right? We need to uh, uh, make knowledge claims that are then interrogated in a public manner. Uh, but it's not just public. It also um, requires that I trust that the claims that the community has accepted or that are sort of in some uh, level of regard and esteem are reliable. Uh, the, the mechanisms of science have to uh, help me know what claims I can rely on and which ones I can't. Uh, otherwise, I have to sort of review every uh, uh, argument that I might want to cite or method I want to build on, and that's just not practical. Uh, but unfortunately, we know from uh, cases of fraud uh, and um, just neglect and, and sort of non-reproducible -repro results, uh, and, and in particular from the systematic uh, study that of 100 replications uh, in psychology, that on the order of maybe 20 to 50 percent uh, of, say, experimental results, uh, do not reproduce um, in the sense that uh, they might be, uh, n there might be no result there, right? It's actually zero, and the original result was uh, a scientist finding noise, uh, or uh, the result is much weaker than um, the initial publication. Okay, so science is, we're trying to build this edifice, uh, but it's only as good as the materials that are coming in, and we need a better process for screening those materials, right? A building that's built on uneven terrain or soft ground uh, will not get very high. Uh, similarly, a building that has uh, materials with um, uneven quality. So I'm going to uh, sort of rush through uh, two aspects of this. One is uh, sharing data and, and how we change the norms around that in code. Uh, the second is um, pre-registration and ways of thinking about it. And then I'm going to try to get to the third uh, very quickly because I think it uh, follows after Brian's talk uh, in terms of thinking about what's the future of science, scientific conversation, that a platform like OSF or others could build and, and could enable us. Okay, so uh, we want uh, scientists to share all relevant files uh, for understanding where their knowledge claims come from. Right, that is practical. Uh, ultimately, uh, I was thinking when, when Brian was talking, uh, you know, what is the utopia of transparency? Is, is it uh, like a 1984 surveillance state where we have cameras on and everything uh, gets shared. And I know one colleague of mine uh, who really wanted to live up to transparency norms um, posted in their uh, replication archive all the emails between them and their uh, coders, uh, they sort of coding history. So there was you know, thousands of emails. Uh, and so any critical reader can go and find out exactly why was this historical observation coded in this way and not another way. Um, so. Uh, so that might be the limit. Um, my, the transparency maxim I'll offer is that we should try to make every step of research as explicit and reproducible as is practical, right? Clearly, uh, at some point, we're going to hit diminishing returns or other constraints. So um, we have to leave it up to each discipline and each uh, researcher to, to negotiate that. Um, but the benefits are, are tremendous. And um, 
I mean, Brian made most of these points. One I, I want to emphasize is the idea that scientific publications used to be uh, like a scrapbook of photos of, of someone who went on a, 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 a vacation or a travel, and they're showing us their, the pictures of their journey, and they're telling us a story from that. And that narrative is only as good as sort of we trust the author's representation of, of what they saw. And, and there the analogy is to data. Whereas with the internet, with modern computing, we no longer need to have this static representation of the data. Now I think of the publication sort of like an advertisement it, as like a guided tour. So the authors say, come with me, reader. I will walk you through a data landscape and show you what I found and show you what's there. But the reader should be free to leave the, the tour at any moment. They can say, I'm curious about what's over that hill or what's behind that you know, curtain, uh, and they should be enabled to do that. So um, I think that's where we're going, and uh, yeah, the, just in terms of facilitating uh, the reproduction of uh, analysis. Okay, I'm um, just a, a fun figure to share. So I collected data on these are the two leading political science journals, uh, and the y-axis is uh, the proportion that state or, or whether the uh, article states that replication files are available. Um, so a few takeaways: one, in the time period 2009 to 2013, uh, at least if we look at APSR on the right which is our number one journal, it wasn't great. Uh, AJPS, on the other hand, started out at around zero and then jumps to about 100%. And as you can probably uh, infer, uh, that's because a new editor came on board and added a policy that says all you know, published AJPS articles need the first footnote must state where replication files are available. So uh, uh, sort of a, a small commitment like that by a journal generated 100% compliance to the letter of the law, but not the spirit. So now the y-axis is W are replication files actually available? And <laughs> nevertheless, we still have 50 to 25% of articles in AJPS, despite a footnote saying our replication files are available here, uh, no replication files could be found there or given about 10 minutes of searching anywhere else on the internet. Um, hopefully, I think the community is adapting. You know, we, we see a creep up. And I should say political science uh, has really embraced transparency uh, norms and standards, in part because of the top uh, sort of a movement, um, transparency and openness uh, promotion guidelines. Uh, so we're, we're getting better. Um, but this is just to show that uh, you know, it really helps to have journals uh, you know, um, providing incentives. Um, I'll skip that. OK, uh, so you know, what, what do we want in complete replication files? Uh, you know, we might want even the emails between the PI and the, the lab uh, members. Um, but I, I won't go that far. I do think we want uh, as far down in the sort of um, chain of uh, inference as possible. And you can think of it as we want to maintain a chain of custody of, of how the original data led to this final uh, claim. Um, and then one other point I just want to share uh, that I, I think is, is symptomatic of, of the state uh, of um, at least maybe political science, but maybe other social sciences, is that I work with surveys and survey experiments. And a key thing you want uh, when you're reading a survey is to see the original survey text, but the verbatim, how, it, how it's laid out, the question that preceded the key question, right? Because uh, you know, text can put the res respondent in a different frame of mind. They interpret later questions differently. Uh, so we know this, uh, that this matters a lot. And yet, to my amazement, leading scholars in my profession and my discipline um, will publish surveys and survey experiments without, there's nowhere on the internet uh, is the actual survey text available. Uh, and so this is not due to uh, technical difficulties. Right? It, is, it is not hard to take a picture or a screenshot or produce a PDF of your survey, uh, or a QSF file, for example, if you use Qualtrics. Uh, so I think what this reflects is either a lack of appreciation of the importance of this level of transparency, uh, or people think they can get away with it, right? With some combination of the two. So, um, you know, Brian uh, is great. He, he builds us tools to, to um, advance transparency. I, I will be a little bit more of the uh, um, cynic or realist. I think we also need the stick, right? Uh, it's here, we, we don't need a tool to, to get this happening. We just need colleagues to know it is not acceptable to you know, produce a survey or survey experimental study and not share the PDF publicly or, or the text of the survey. OK. Um, and we could even uh, make stronger norms. Uh, we could uh, have journals think that you should, the paper should be retracted if it can't be reproduced uh, you know, from the original data. Um, and then, of course, also, as Brian mentioned, we should uh, find ways of weighting transparency 
in the incentive structure where it matters. We could rank uh, uh, and, and judge journals, and then when considering hiring and promoting um, scholars, uh, we should uh, upweight transparency as a criterion. Uh, okay, so this is the beautiful figure about the 100 uh, psychology studies. Um, and the main takeaway here is, you know, some replicated. They, the replicated effect uh, was about the same as the original effect, uh, but some, many, uh, did not replicate. They were, the estimated effect in replication was around zero. Um, and this, is, this issue is not addressed by what I've just been discussing, uh, the sharing of uh, code and data, because this could be due to uh, publication bias. It could be due to the researcher who runs 100 experiments and shares the five that are most interesting, right? Uh, so to address that, we need pre-registration, or, or there's some other solutions. And I just want to flag a trade-off in pre-registration that, uh, unlike data sharing and code sharing, which I think is um, unarguable, there's very little uh, sort of cost to it, with pre-registration, uh, in my own experience, and, and especially with my students, um, they, there's a risk of spending too much time uh, at the pre-registration stage and really slowing down uh, the research process. So uh, students will, um, because I'll give a, a very you know, um, emphatic lecture about the importance of pre-registration, they will spend a month or two theorizing you know, uh, and, and designing their study. Uh, and then when they do it, they get a null. Right? So uh, that's a month or two. Uh, you know, potentially wasted. Now, hopefully there, there's benefits. Um, but the main point that I want to make is that a lot of science is exploratory and inductive. That's, and, and like a lot of the value that's generated from science comes from the exploratory and inductive process. So we just need to find ways of preserving that value and recognizing that, that it's valuable at the same time as, as insisting that uh, work distinguishes whether it's confirmatory or exploratory by systematically doing pre-registration. Um, and then the other pitfall is that anticipating this time cost, scholars don't pre-register at all. Uh, so my recommendation is uh, pre-register all the time, but don't, don't uh, require yourself to have a perfect pre-registration. Don't require it be you know, uh, a fully fleshed theory necessarily if you're not there uh, with full pre-analysis code. I mean, that's great if you can do it, but uh, if it's just one paragraph, uh, that's great. And um, OSF, as I understand, as Brian's been using it, has sort of enabled that level of uh, different levels of sharing. So you might have a summary minutes from your lab meeting, and that would be your pre-registration. And I think that's a, a, a good uh, compromise. Um, and yeah, there's other ways. Uh, ben Olkin mentions, a, I think, a good way <clears throat> where you take out the treatment variable, and then you analyze your data. Uh, so then you get to see what the data looks like and how, it, how the outcome correlates with various covariates, uh, but you can't um, p-hack because the treatment variable is not connected to the outcome. Uh, so that's a promising way. Uh, okay, and I'll, I might come back to that because do you know how much time I have? Five minutes. Okay, yeah. So I want to get to this. Um, so this speaks to um, Brian's later slides, uh, which are sort of what's the future of scientific conversation, right? And and this idea that uh, publication and evaluation are currently are, are intertwined and should be separated is exactly right. Um, and I, I'll just sketch sort of a vision that I think uh, OSF is moving towards and, and other. Um, uh, uh, groups are, are sort of starting to build out the, the features for this. Uh, and I'll tell you the vision that I think would be excellent and I, I sort of think is an attractor for scientific conversation. And given how many scientists we have here, uh, I would love you know, your thoughts if, if this makes sense. <clears throat> so if I want to buy a book, here's Gelman and Hill's uh, uh, data analysis um, textbook. I can go to the Cambridge <clears throat> uh, the publisher's website and what do I get? I get a title, I get their author name, I get the price, the cover art. I can look inside so I can actually read the whole or much of the book. Um, but what I don't get is uh, what I started off by saying we need in science, which is uh, the sort of synthesized expert evaluation of my peers and colleagues. Right? I don't want to have to read the whole book to decide whether I should buy it. I want to delegate to my colleagues who have already read it uh, their judgment and then uh, integrate it in some uh, appropriate way. We now have that service. Uh, Amazon provides it for us. Um, these aren't necessarily my colleagues who are doing this, though sometimes they are. Uh, but you have a community of readers who s volunteer time uh, to share their judgment uh, and assessment of a book. Uh, not only do you have the quantitative ratings, which is a useful way to screen uh, books, but you also have a detailed uh, review and a holistic review. Amazon also uh, helpfully gives us this, what did these customers who bought this also buy? 
uh, which is a you know, useful uh, service that currently, um, well, uh, at least the Cambridge uh, website would not provide. So here's a, uh, an article from our leading journal. And again, we get what the publisher provides. So we get the, the sort of details, the title, the abstract, the author name. Um, but it's all shared, it's all provided by a self-interested group. The authors have a motivation to portray the results in a certain light. The publishers have a motivation to portray it in a certain light. There's no third party here telling me you know, what they thought of this. Um, and so that's where I think we want to go. We want to build a web platform or, or a, uh, an online uh, forum where the community discusses works, uh, hopefully expresses them in a quantitative metric that can be aggregated in a sensible way uh, to facilitate um, my assessment of other works so that I don't have to spend two hours reading this paper to figure out if I trust the results or not. Uh, my colleague who already did that can basically tell me indirectly. And so we have this um, more, more efficient uh, conversation. This already happens offline, right? If, if I, I want to know if this works any good, I might email my colleague who I know uh, has read it and, and ask them for their input. So we just want to build a web platform so that everyone has access to that and it, it uh, facilitates um, conversation. Uh, so here's uh, one group um, that uh, at least provided sort of a visual representation of what I think it could look like. This is Science Open. Here you have an article, right? The same title, authors, uh, you know, maybe an abstract. Uh, and then what I'm really looking for, right, is the uh, quantitative summary of what readers think of this work. And then you can imagine a holistic review down here that's been upvoted by all the readers. So the first thing you would see is uh, an expert judgment, third party, saying, this is what I think of this piece. And it's not just a troll or, or, or a negative uh, you know, uh, response. It's someone who really shares, this is what this work achieves, and this is where it falls short. These are the scope conditions. Um, this is what's impressive. This is what you, you can look out for when you're reading this. Right? A, a third party perspective that I can quickly get to that's already been crowdsourced uh, you know, by the community so that when I get there, it's at the, the, the top of visibility. Um, okay, there's a lot of things we could add to that, uh, and I'll just list some. Um, so there's this idea of a wiki abstract, right? Rather than have the authors, who again have this uh, self-interest in presenting their re results as being innovative and break uh, uh, outstanding, I would love to hear what, what expert reviewers think was actually achieved in the paper, right? What did the results actually show? Uh, so a more disinterested uh, representation. Um, the ratings could be on importance, credibility, clarity. Those are three metrics that I think would be useful. Um, you, you probably don't want uh, just some naive averaging of over, over everyone's ratings, especially if it's really open to the public, right? You wouldn't want to read like climate science uh, quantitative ratings if a certain you know political group decides to to get on there and downvote um, all of them, <clears throat> or even maybe one lab sort of systematically downvotes another lab's uh, work. Uh, so you could have all kinds of customized ratings uh, where you might um, subset on scholars of a certain uh, achievement uh, or a certain um, like social network. Uh, entrepreneurs could even provide the service. They could say, use my uh, ratings algorithm, uh, which uh, pulls from um, esteemed, respected scholars. Uh, OK, so then you'd have the, the community would upvote useful contributions so that the, the first thing you'd see, like in Stack Exchange or Reddit or Quora or Amazon reviews, is the sort of overall most helpful <coughs> assessment of the piece. Uh, but also contributors who are systematically helpful would be upvoted. And then every subsequent contribution that they make would be more likely to be visible. And conversely, contributors who are systematically uh, writing ad hominem things or uh, unhelpful comments would be downvoted and would have difficulties getting uh, visibility. Uh, you could have a range of um, anonymity. So you could, uh, though I think you'd probably want each user to have some kind of uh, um, connection to an actual human identity. Uh, though you can work, you could try with an anonymous uh, model. Um, but you could go all the way to a signed model where everyone has to use their real name. Um, though I suspect, given the prevalence of single blind peer review, at least in science, we probably want to preserve some, at least some kind of blinded mode. So you could log in, ma you know, make your contributions under a pseudonym. Uh, but the editors would still know who you are. And so that would prevent uh, kind of collusion amongst uh, you know, circles of scholars who are upvoting or downvoting their rivals. Uh, it, would prevent, it would help you identify trolls. Uh, and anyhow, I think it would just help keep the whole process more 
uh, productive. And then last uh, fun idea that to throw out there, for any uh, metric that is um, like socially exogenous uh, and um, really verifiable as, as sort of either zero or one, you could build a prediction market onto it. Uh, so the main, uh, the obvious application is replicability. So if there's an experiment uh, that's done, you could have a prediction market for whether the, the experiment would replicate according to some <coughs> standard of replication. Uh, and um, if, if the, well, there's various ways, but if the, if the replication is ever done according to some standard, by, perhaps by some consortium of labs, uh, then the prediction market would pay out. So I think you know, it's inevitable that science will go to something like this. There will be a much richer conversation in five and 10 years online. I, I can imagine it matters how we, what, how we get there. Right? I can imagine there's path dependence. If we get there, uh, if the scientists own the, the platform, it could be more productive than if um, a private company owns the platform and the, the culture that we establish going in. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to your thoughts. And if anyone's really interested in this, I'd love to talk with you afterwards. Thanks.